Gavin might, but me Gavin and might. I don't. Yeah. I don't understand music. Theory. Me neither. I never have. Me neither. Well, you do a bit with your progressions and your, you know, all this one five four and all that sort of stuff and what chords follow. And one five four. That's a wire album, isn't it? I don't know. Are there, you know, <laughs> there are these chord sequences and. You can you can you can play blues or you can join in on a jam. Okay, so all right, so if you're there, I'm about there, and Gavin's here in the musical theory scales. Gavin's <sighs> up here. Well, that, that's kind of it's my strength and my weakness, is that I don't really understand musical theory, so I develop my own relationship with music, um, and I think for Gavin it's completely the opposite. Gavin understands. Yeah. <laughs> every. Gavin, Gavin is uh, obviously, you know, he's a he's a very he's an exceptional musician. He's very trained to a very high end, uh, and his interest is almost mathematical. Um, that does him a disservice because that almost implies that his his ideas about music are just technical and there's no heart to them, which is not the case. But I think he starts off from the point of view of he's fascinated by unusual rhythm rhythms and polyrhythms and a lot of his initi initiation of songs and ideas would come um, with very uh, unusual and complex time signatures like for example herd culling is based on one of his rhythms which is an 11 and so for me and Richard it's when we get something like that it's like okay how can we make this listenable <laughs> how can we make this accessible to you know to the fans that listen to our music and but still keep that level of complexity there for anyone that wants to go below the surface and, and explore the, the more kind of complex relationships going on so um i think me and richard i mean i always cons i always describe myself as a musical idiot i don't know a lot of the time what i'm doing very often i would find for example with my solo band i would write songs and then I would take them into to the, my band, who are all amazing musicians, and I would say, well, it goes like this. And I would play, show them the chords, and my keyboard player, Adam, would say, ah, oh, you're playing an A-flat diminished ninth there. And I'm like, whatever. You know, I had no idea. No idea. I don't need to know. I don't need to know. So it's almost like approaching music from that kind of idiot perspective. Like, you don't quite know what you're doing, but you know when it sounds good. And I think Richard has a similar approach to, to sound too, don't you? Yeah, but worse. I'm a worse musician. Yeah, but you're a keyboard player, so you don't have to know those things, Richard. No. Just turn the knob. Yeah. Press the note, turn the knob. Well, that was it. Yeah. The controllers on the, on the synthesizers became more important to me than the keys. Once I'd made that discovery, then everything was fine, and I found my way in music. So if I played one note, I'd make one note do something interesting and evolve, rather than try and play a hundred notes with a very linear, boring sound. Well, funnily enough, no. It's the only song on the record I brought to the band kind of as it was. But here's the thing. Gavin was the one that told me what I was doing because I came in and I'd, 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 I'd consciously made a decision to, to write a song where the rhythmic meter was constantly shifting, but I couldn't honestly have told you exactly what was going on. And he said, well, you've got a bar of three, then a bar of 11, then a bar of five. So he worked it all out. And he, in fact, he wrote it all out. And, and he, said, he gave me the music, so now I can kind of follow it myself. But when I wrote it, again, it was very much in an intuitive, idiot, savant kind of way. I wasn't, tr I wasn't sort of sitting down and creating a mathematical equation. I was allowing the rhythms to constantly shift because I wanted, and again, this is where it gets a little bit more pretentious, I wanted the lyrics which are on the surface about rebirth to also have a little bit of unease and uncertainty about them too because we live in a time where it doesn't matter how optimistic you are, you can't help but feel a bit paranoid for what's going on in the world. So the poetic side of my artistic sensibility wanted to have a little bit of darkness a little bit of unease in what was essentially a song about um, optimism and rebirth I thought well one way we can do that is the lyrics will be all about this wonderful rebirth but the rhythm will be constantly shifting and changing and giving you that sense of you're not quite secure you have this unease in in the feeling of the song 
So I, ch I ch started chopping up the length of the bar lines um, to create that feeling. And I don't know if it, if it comes across or not, but that was my idea. But then Gavin is the one that told me what I was doing and, and worked it out, yeah. Depends, in that case, the lyrics came as the song came. But normally, um, like for example, with the song Dignity, which Richard mentioned before, the whole story came to me only when I heard what Richard had done. So he sent me this track which had this kind of opening ambient, very sounded very nostalgic to me, this opening ambient texture. And straight away I thought about a story about a guy living on the street, homeless guy, that used to be incredibly successful, like a pop star or a movie star or a business mogul, and no one sees that. They just pass him by, they think he's just another bum. So there's a whole backstory to this individual. And I can't tell you why, but that was the story that popped into my head when I heard those opening chords that Richard sent me. So there is a symbiotic relationship between the sound or the atmosphere of the music and the lyrics, but in that case the lyrics came out of the music. Well, I think that probably you have more solos on this record than I do, don't you? I haven't counted. More than normal, yeah. Got a lot of keyboard solos, and you kind of improvise, don't you? Really? Yeah. 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 I think I think oh. I'm the same. I think I improvise, but then the improvisation okay. sort of coalesce into something. Yeah. I mean, with, with my solos, I I try to put an element into the sound that's slightly uh, disharmonic, to a sort of overtone or something, just to take it away from this usual kind of sound that you get. Pentatonic blues. Some. Yeah. Yeah. But. There'll be some overtone, and also with modulation, instead of modulation, modulating the pitch, which a lot of keyboard players do, I modulate a noise, so it's like a pink noise modulation, and that introduces another texture into the solo. So you have the security of the notes that you can recognise, but there's something, over, there's this overtone that is giving it what I like to think of an otherworldly sound. My solos, I improvise a lot and then I compile and then I learn what I've compiled and replay it, if that makes sense. So I... We I, don't read music, basically. I can't read music. So I just twiddle away and then I find all the bits I like, chop it together, but then it sounds very unnatural. But then you learn it and you play it as if you'd written it. That's, that's what I do. I'm not good enough to think fast enough to improvise solos like that. But um, yeah, so the solos I play live are basically... Le I learn from the record.